Today, we're going to begin a new uh, series of messages, and without a doubt, one of the most fascinating characters in, in all of human history, and we can probably bring me down just a little bit, We've got a different mic on than usual, but one of the most fascinating characters in history, and certainly one of the most important, is the man Moses. And uh, if you're a little bit older, how many of you are old enough you remember the old uh, Cecil B. DeMille's movie, The Ten Commandments? Anybody remember watching that? And it would every year come on TV and it would have great ratings. If you're younger, you have a different movie to reference Moses. How many of you have seen The, the Prince of Egypt? So yeah, yeah, you know, some of the younger ones, you remember that, the animated movie. And both of those are very well loved films. And there's no question that Moses' life is a very, very interesting story, but it's much more than that. And as we take a closer look at the events, in his life, there are, there are so many lessons that we can learn, lessons that still have meaning for us today. And this week, we're, we're beginning a new series called Lessons from the Life of Moses. And for the next few weeks, whoa, what happened there? We lost it. For the next few weeks, um, we are, we're going to examine certain events uh, in Moses' life, some, some of the highlights, some of the lowlights, some of the turning points, and and we're going to see what God has to say to us and them. And the reason we can do that is because in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 6, Paul said, and he's speaking of all the events of the Old Testament, he said, these things occurred as examples for us. So we can look back to the Old Testament, we can see that the events that happen, the peoples that are, that, that are there, the stories that are told, that they're all there to teach us something. They're there for, for, an, for a purpose. And the things that happen to Moses happen for a reason. And, and, and one of those reasons is so that God can teach us more about himself. So today, what we're going to do today is we're going to take a look at how God placed a special call in Moses's life. The truth was God had big plans for Moses. And what I want you to realize today and the title of the message today is that God has big plans for you as well. And that's what we're going to talk about. He used Moses in a great way and he wants to use you in a great way. So would you just bow your head and let's ask for the Lord's help as we get into the word. Father, as we come into your presence, we come and we ask, Lord Jesus, that you would help us. We pray, Lord, that as we hear from your word, that you would encourage us, that you would inspire us, that you would speak words of life to us, that God, in Jesus' name, you would accomplish your will and your purpose and help us to realize, God, that we're not here just to mark time. We're not here just to float through our life. We're not here just to exist, but Lord... There's a, there, this is our moment, this is our chance, this is our opportunity, and you've got a plan, and you want to use us, God, to touch the lives of people around us. And I pray, God, that you would encourage us, that you would empower us, you would begin to do that work in us. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, it appears, when you look at the life of Moses, it appears that Moses always had a sense of God's call in his life, but it took some time to determine exactly how he was supposed to fulfill it. I think some of us can probably relate to that. Some of us, we, we hear, we say, well, I know God's got a plan for me, but I just can't figure out how I'm supposed to live it out. I'm not, I don't know what to do with this. And, but the, the, the lesson that Moses eventually learned is that a person becomes most effective in life when he or she decides to do God's will, God's way. See, that's really important for us because sometimes we know what God's will is and then we try to carry out God's will with our own plans and our own way. And it's important for us to learn how important it is not just to know what God's will is, but to know how he wants us to carry it out. So as we look at how Moses came to discover God's will, it will help you discover God's plan for your life. So let's take a closer look at Moses' life and the things that we can learn from him. First of all, Moses' story teaches us that your entire life has been leading up to God's call. And uh, Chuck, it sounded better, but could you bump me up just a little bit? Uh, I'm afraid if I, if I don't hear myself, I start getting going too hard. And then, you know, in the summer, I always lose my voice. And so I don't want to, some of you are like, don't turn it up, Chuck. If he loses a voice, he'll go shorter. Uh, but it's not true. I won't go shorter. You're... <laughs> Somebody said, how true. That was, that was rude. You hurt my feelings. It is true. Your entire life has been, has been leading up to God's call. 
We got a little bit of reverb going up here. Your entire life has been leading up to God's call. And as, as you look uh, at, at the life of Moses, you can see how God prepared him from the very beginning. As you follow the story, you can see God's hand in, in his life all along the way. Go all the way back to the birth of Moses. When Moses was born, most of you will remember the story. The Hebrew people were slaves in Egypt and Pharaoh, the leader of Egypt, felt threatened by the growing number of, of Hebrew children. He was afraid that their numbers would go, grow so great that they'd become a threat, that they'd, they'd ha there'd be a rebellion. So what he did was he ordered, if you remember, he ordered all the newborn males to be put to death. Moses' mother, when Moses was born, as you can imagine, any mom here could imagine, you, you could put yourself in her place and this is what you would do. You would find any way you could to help your child survive, but she just could not bear to turn him over to the Egyptian authorities. She could not stand the thought of her newborn born baby uh, dying, and so she hid the fact of his birth as long as she could. Now, how many of you know that hiding a newborn baby is, is not that easy because babies like to cry? Anybody, everybody notice that babies tend to be noisy? Yes. Some, some of you have, you know, well, I was going to say some of you never grew out of that stage, but, um, but uh, babies are noisy. And so she hid it as long as she could and got to the point where there's just no way possible to hide this child anymore. And so finally, in a desperate attempt to, to spare his life, she placed Moses in a basket and, uh, and she put the basket into the Nile River, hoping and praying that somehow or another, some way God would protect him and guide him to safety. And the good news is, as we read the story, is that God answered her, her prayer. Pharaoh's daughter found Moses in the, in the Nile. Exodus 2.10 tells us that she took him and she raised him as her own. In fact, actually the first couple of years of his life, two or three years of his life, Moses was actually raised by his own mother because uh, uh, Moses' sister ran out there and said, hey, do you need somebody to take care of this baby while he's little? Since, you know, you, you're not able to feed the child or that sort of thing. And she said, sure. And so Moses was raised in the first few years of his life in his own home. And, and then went on to, to live with Pharaoh's daughter and she raised him as his own. Then you, you look at, as he was being raised, you look at the education of Moses. And, and the thing, we, we t were told a lot about Moses' life in the books, you know, the early books in the, in the book of Genesis, for example. But there's a speech that was made by Stephen in Acts chapter 7 that actually tells us a little more about the early life of Moses. Things that the Old Testament it fills us in on some details that we're not told. In Acts chapter 7 verses 20, and 20, through, 20 through 22, Stephen is speaking. This is what he says. At that time Moses was born and he was no ordinary child. For three months he was cared for in his father's house. When he was placed outside, Pharaoh's daughter took him and brought him up as her own son. Moses was educated in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was powerful in speech and action. Now that's a really interesting statement there at the very end because we're going to con contrast that with Moses' perception of himself because we're told here that as a result of this education, this upbringing, that Moses was powerful in speech and action. So even though he was born a Hebrew slave, God worked it out for Moses to be raised in the house of Pharaoh. And he was educated in the wisdom of the Egyptians. And Stephen said that Moses, as I said, was powerful in speech and actions. And we know from the, the rest of the things, some of the other things that Stephen said, we know that Moses somehow or another had this ambition in his life. He had this desire to rescue his people from the torment of their Egyptian captors. So even though he was raised in, in uh, for the most part in, in Pharaoh's household and his, Pharaoh's daughter's uh, tutelage, he still knew he was a Hebrew. He knew that. That was never, that was never a question in his mind. And he had a desire, desire to rescue his people, the, the Israelites, from the torment of the Egyptians. Look what it says in verses 24 through 25 of Acts 7. He saw one of them. No, Moses saw one of the uh, one of. Uh, the uh, Israelites, he saw one of them being mistreated by an Egyptian. So he went to his defense and avenged him by killing the Egyptian. Moses thought that his own people would realize that God was using him to rescue them, but they did not. So the scripture says right here that he thought that in this moment, 
that the people of Israel would recognize that he was there to deliver them, that he was going to rescue them, that he was the man who was going to set them free, that he was the man, he was the guy. He says he believed that that was the moment that when he stood up for that Israelite, that the rest of the Israelites would say, hey, we've got a leader now, let's get behind him. And, and, but, but that didn't happen. That didn't happen. As a matter of fact, that event actually forced Moses to flee the country and to live in the land of Midian. And it appears in that moment that his dream to save the Hebrew people had gone up in smoke. And that was Moses was about 40 years old when that happened. And then for the next 40 years, Moses tended flocks belonging to his father-in-law. You know, it, it would appear to the casual observer that Moses had been forgotten by God and, and that he had failed, and that he'd become nothing more than a could have been. And there's times in our lives when we have failed and we look at ourselves and we say, oh, oh, what could have been? If only I made that choice. If only I'd make this, made this choice. If only I hadn't done that, then maybe things would have come out differently. And I, I guarantee you that that's where Moses was and what he was believing. But the good news was that God did not forget about Moses. And, and not only that, God God did not forget about the plight of, the, of his people of Israel. During this time, what was happening, as we'll see in just a moment, there were some important changes taking place in Moses' personal life. This time as a sheep herder was a time of, of character building for Moses. God was waiting for the day when he could use Moses in a great way. And in the same way, we need to understand that God will use all the events of your life as points of preparation for the calling he has given to you. We have to know there is a reason that you are alive. There's a reason you were born into the family into which you were born. There is a reason why you grew up in the geographical area in which you grew up. The reason, there's a reason why you are alive in this generation, in this troubled time, in this America that is so divided and troubled. There's a reason why you are here now. There's a reason why God didn't, ha didn't have you born sometime back in the forties or sometime in the future. He has appointed you for such a time is this. And all the events of your life, both good and bad, are all part of the process of preparation. Now, I'm not saying that God causes the bad things. Don't misunderstand me there. That's not what I'm saying at all. But I'm saying that God is able to redeem those harmful, hurtful, painful moments. And even in the, when those things happen, God is able to redeem it and use it to build your character, to prepare you for what he has for you. You can actually see that in the life of Joseph in the Old Testament, when his brothers sold him into slavery, when finally at the end of the, uh, of the story, near the end of the story, when Joseph reveals himself to his brothers and they realize this is the guy we sold into slavery. And they're all afraid because here's a man who has every reason to kill them and he has all the power to make it happen. But he looks at them and says, hey, don't, don't be afraid of me. Because he said, what you, in, you intended it for evil but God meant it for good. God redeemed the evil actions of another person to bring good out of it. We have to believe that he can do that. And whatever has happened in your life, whatever, whatever bad events have happened in your life, whatever bad things have happened to you, you have to know that God can redeem that and he can bring good out of it. Maybe you, you feel like your life to this point has been a complete and total failure. Maybe you had some dreams about what you could accomplish with your life. And, and now you look at yourself and you look at your surroundings and it appears that you have fallen desperately short of the mark. Maybe you have made some mistakes and, and you've made a complete mess of everything in your life. And, and it's caused you to, to begin to believe that your only choice is, to just, is just to give up and to give in and to quit and just not even try anymore. Maybe something painful happened in your childhood or in your past, something that, that, that causes you to wonder, why me? Why did, why did I have to go through this? But you need to know God can use the events of your entire life, even the mistakes, even the things that were beyond your control, even the most painful moments of your life. He can use those things to shape your life in such a way to bring him glory and to make your life matter. Right now, regardless of, of the circumstances in your life, you need to know you are being trained for God's purpose. Where you are right now. Some of us, we would like to be in a different place in our lives. 
I'm not going to take a survey there because I don't need to know that. But some of us look at our lives and say, man, this is this is not, you know, maybe it's not too bad right now, but this is not where I want to stay. I don't want to live here. But you need to know that even that moment, even that place, you are being trained for God's purpose. You are being prepared for his plan for your life. Remember, even our worst experiences become part of the process of preparation. So God has big plans for you and your entire life has been leading you toward his plan for your life. Second thing I want you to notice about discovering God's plan is that God will wait until you're ready to be used. He'll wait until you're ready to be used. I don't know how many sports fans we have here, but I've noticed one thing. There is a difference in the way professional football teams and professional baseball teams prepare their rookies. Have you ever noticed that? Most NFL teams will sign some hotshot rookie, you know, first round, maybe a first, uh, first pick of the draft or whatever, quarterback, quarterback, for example, and they sign them to a multi-million dollar contract and they expect to get their money's worth almost immediately. And the fact is, it kind of rarely happens. Usually it takes a little bit of time, but, but they want their money's worth. They want performance right away. But Major League Baseball uses a completely different strategy. It's not uncommon at all for a baseball team to sign a rookie, a really highly touted rookie, somebody extremely talented, and they sign them to this high price contract and then send them to the minor leagues to play ball. And they wait for them to be ready before they're brought up to the major leagues. And I say that to say this, God's method of preparation is a lot more like the baseball model than the football model. God will not throw you to the lions before you're ready. Daniel, you know, if his faith had not been where it was, God would not have put him in a position where he was thrown into the lion's den before he was ready for it. God will not move you into the place where he wants you before you're ready because he, he wants, he gives you a chance to prepare. He gives you a chance to grow into it. Roger Breland, the director of the music group Truth, once said, God will never use you publicly until he has tutored you privately. God will prepare you. He will tutor you to, for the work that he has called you to do. There's a saying I heard many years ago, and I, I find, I believe it's very true. I don't know who came up with it first, but it's a really powerful statement that says God doesn't call a qualified. He qualifies the called. God doesn't call the qualified, he qualifies the call. What does that mean? That he doesn't look at you and say, Woo, man, that, that, that person is so gifted, so talented, I better get him in ministry in a hurry before I waste this moment. No, he doesn't call you because you're great, because you're awesome, because you're really good at something. He calls you because you are weak. And then in your weakness, he says, now let me prepare you. Now let me empower you. Now let me give you gifts that go beyond your natural ability. I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to call you because you're qualified for this, but I'm going to call you and then I'm going to qualify you by making you ready. And sometimes, listen, friend, this is not a pleasant thing to know, but sometimes that means he lets you take some, some lumps. Anybody been there? Anybody? Let me see your hand. You ever had, you got your God lumps? <laughs> yeah. And he, 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 he makes you, he, it means letting you take some bumps in the minor leagues while you're getting ready for the big leagues. It means that he, you take some bumps in the smaller areas and the small places of faithfulness while he's getting ready for the, the greater ministry that he has for you. You know, when Moses intervened in the conflict between the Egyptian and the Israelite, he in that moment thought his time had come. He thought, this is it. He thought he was ready, but the truth was he, he wasn't ready. He wanted to save the Hebrew people from the oppression of their captors. And according to the book of Acts, as we read a moment ago, he expected them to recognize him as their savior, that he, they would recognize that he was there to rescue them, only it just didn't work out that way. Why is that? Well, it's because Moses still had some important lessons to learn. He knew God's will, but he was trying to do it outside of God's way. His ego was still in the way. 
His, his heart wasn't exactly where it needed to be. In his effort to be the hero, he killed this Egyptian. And when that was made public, he ran to avoid being executed by Pharaoh. And he eventually ended up in Midian where he met his wife and became the father of two sons. And he spent the next 40 years working as a sheep herder. But you know what? The years spent in the desert was not wasted time. The years spent in the desert proved to be a crucial time in Moses' preparation for leadership. Because here's what I want you to notice. I want you to hear this, and this is important, because this is about the work of God in your life as He works in you, as He changes you, as He prepares you for the calling He has for your life. The man God spoke to through the burning bush was not the same man who had run from Egypt 40 years earlier. Yes, it was still Moses, but he was not the same as he was 40 years earlier. What was happening? God was waiting for Moses to be ready to be used. And when the time finally arrived, you see a tremendous difference in Moses' attitude. And we're going to see what it is, the, one of the greatest uh, qualifications, one of the great things that God wants to develop in your life to prepare you for ministry but let's look at the difference in Moses. Remember the story? God appeared to Moses in Exodus chapter 3, verses 6 through 10 at the burning bush. This is what he happened. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the, that land into a land uh, and uh, uh, to a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. Listen to this last verse. So now go. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. That's exactly what Moses was trying to do 40 years earlier. Right? He said what we read in the book of Acts. He said that when he killed that Egyptian, he thought the Israelites would recognize that he was there to rescue them. But they didn't. Now, here's God, 40 years later, saying, okay, now, Moses, you, you heard me right. You, you did in your heart what you were trying to do was the right thing, but it was the wrong time. He said, now's the time. Now I'm going to send you back to Pharaoh, and I'm going to use you to bring the people of Israel out of Egypt. Now, 40 years earlier, Moses had been ready to kill off the Egyptians one by one. I mean, apparently he took on one, killed him, and he's like, okay, let's do this thing. And now, as he is confronted with God's plan for his life, the idea of rescuing the Hebrew people generates a completely different response. I want you to see some of the things that Moses said, because there's this ongoing dialogue with Moses, between Moses and God at the burning bush. And I want you to just look at some of the responses that Moses gave in that dialogue. Exodus 3.11, Moses says, But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? Well, that doesn't sound like the Moses of 40 years ago. Exodus 4.1, Moses answered, What if they don't believe me or listen to me and say, The Lord did not appear to you? All that self-confidence is gone. Exodus 4.10, Moses said to the Lord, O Lord, I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you have spoken in your, to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue. Wait a minute. What did Stephen say about him? He was powerful in speech and action. Don't you think maybe that 40 years ago, Moses was pretty proud of his powerful speech? And now he realized that no matter how powerful his speech is, it's useless on his own. Verse 13, chapter 4. But Moses said, now he finally just gets down to it, comes to the brass tacks, and really gets down to the, to the nitty-gritty of it. He's, but Moses said, oh Lord, please send someone else to do it. Quite different than the younger Moses, isn't it? Before, Moses' problem was not that he was self-confident. His problem was that he was overconfident. He was overconfident in himself. 
He was putting too much faith in himself and not enough faith in God. And it took 40 years in the desert for Moses to learn to let go of his own pride. It took 40 years in the desert for him to realize he didn't have what it took. It took 40 years in the desert to realize that no matter how hard he worked, no matter how kind of, what kind of effort he put into it on his own, he was not going to fulfill the call of God in his life. He was not going to set the Israelites free. And at that point in time, after 40 years, he thought it was all done. You know, someone, I think it was Charles Swindoll, said that Moses' life can be broken down into three sections. Moses lived to be, I don't know if you know this, he lived to be 120 years of age. And for the first 40 years of his life, Moses thought he was really something. Growing up in the house of Pharaoh, getting educated, he knew way more than any of those other Israelites. He was a very well-educated, powerful man. He was really something. The second 40 years of his life out in the desert of Midian, he found out he was really nothing. That all of those things meant nothing. That he still had no power. He was nothing. But the good news is he had another 40 years. And the next 40 years of his life, what Moses discovered was that God loves to use nothings. God loves to use the weak. God loves to use the foolish. And he uses those things, as Paul said, to confound the strong and to confound the, the wise. And Moses discovered at the end of the first 80 years of his life, when he finally realized he was nothing, he discovered the next 40 years that God can do miracles through somebody who realizes he's nothing. And as soon as Moses was ready, as soon as he was humble, as soon as he had let go of his own pride, then God put his plan into action. Here's what I want you to realize. And this is so important. God did not make Moses wait until he was 80 years old to be used in a great way. Moses made God wait. It took that long for him to let go of his pride. And I say that, 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 it's, that with confidence. It, it took 40 years in the desert before Moses had reached the point where he was confident. His confidence was in God and not in himself. He did not have to wait until he was 80. He chose to wait until he was 80. And the reason I say that, that it's not about the 80 years in the wilderness is because, in contrast, King David, as a very, very young man, was used by God in great ways, even as a teenager. Because David reached that place of humility long before Moses did. God has big plans for you. I believe that. I'm a, I'm a, if I could look at every one of you right in the eye, if I could sit down with you face to face, I'd look you in the eyes and I'd say to you, God has big plans for you. And, and there's much that you can accomplish for his glory. But you need to know he won't send you into the battle until you're equipped for the fight, until you're ready, until you're humble in his presence until you're willing to say, it is not about me. It's not about my reputation. It's not about people seeing what a good person I am. It's not about me or my giftings or anything at all. It is all about him. I am nothing. So God, can you use a nothing? Now, of course, as I said, Moses made God wait. Now, we understand that there are times when you have to wait on God's timing. That's part of doing God's will, God's way. But don't make God wait on you. When God is saying, now move, do this, don't make him wait. He can't use you until you're ready. So I urge you, friend, get ready. Be absolutely devoted to God. Surrender to him. Be absolutely determined to do his will. Be absolutely dependent on his strength in your life. Stop relying on your own abilities. Stop relying on your own gifts. Stop relying on your own strength and throw yourself on his mercy and say, God, I finally realize it. I finally see I am nothing. And if you can use me to bring glory to your name, here I am. The sooner we come to this point, in our lives, the sooner God can, can begin to use us. Here's the third thing I want you to notice about discovering God's plan for your life. And I love this one. God's dreams 
are way bigger than your dreams. God's dreams are way bigger than your dreams. You know, Moses had a dream when he was a young man. And, and I, 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 can, I think looking at his life, I can say that Moses, one of his dreams was that he wanted to help people. You know, I, I, the idea was to help the Hebrew people one by one, as we see this in the story of him killing the Egyptian. But when that plan failed, he fled to Midian. And once again, he came to the rescue of someone in trouble. Because if you read his story, you, you find out that uh, when he gets to Midian, there was a group of young women who were attempting to draw water for their father's sheep. And they were driven away from the well by a group of shepherds there. And Moses saw what was going on and he stood up for them and he chased those shepherds away and he made it possible for the women to get to the water. And the women and their father were very, very impressed by him. And in fact, they invited Moses to, the, the father invited Moses to his home. And eventually, Moses married one of the women that he met at the well that day. Well, God had a dream for Moses. And it was way bigger than just simply helping a person here and there. It was way bigger than anything Moses could have ever imagined. God's plan was that Moses would lead the nation of uh, uh, lead a nation of slaves to freedom without even picking up a sword. See, the Israelites had been in bondage for this point in time, at this point in time, for more than 430 years. And God chose Moses to release them from captivity. You know what? Our plans are almost always, well, I would say always, our plans are smaller than God's plans. We often dream of having a little bit of success in life because, frankly, a little bit of success can be pretty comfortable, can't it? However, God's dream, here's what you need to hear. Our, our, our go thought, our idea of success, our goal, we dream of being comfortable. But God's dream for you will take you beyond your comfort zone and will challenge you to do something bigger than anything you could have ever imagined. Lou Wallace was a man who wrote the book Ben-Hur back in 1880. Most of you have heard that, uh, the, the, you've seen the movie, uh, but when he wrote the book Ben-Hur, he optimistically in 1880 told his wife that he hoped that the book would earn him up to $100 a year in royalties. Now, that was, that was pretty good money. It wasn't bad money in, the, in 1880, but he had no idea how big it was going to become. Of course, that novel about a slave who converts to Christianity eventually sold millions of copies and was made into a motion picture three different times, twice as a silent film, and then once in the film starring Charleston Heston that we all think about, if you've seen that, you remember the chariot race, all that kind of stuff going on. Lou Wallace and his heirs earned more from that story than he could ever have believed possible. And as a, you know, as a young Christian, I, I remember being challenged, uh, and I think this is a great, great thought, great challenge. I was being challenged, I remember being challenged to attempt something so great that unless God intervenes, you're sure to fail. Attempt something so great that unless God intervenes, you're sure to fail. Now, I will say this, after walking with the Lord for a while, I would maybe modify that slightly, and I would urge you, before, jump first and pray later. Maybe you should include God in the first place, and then say, okay, when he says, this is my plan, and you realize this is something I can never happen without you, God, then you go ahead and go for it. But, but doing God's will, God's will, God's way involves asking him to give you a dream for your life that is so magnificent, so huge, so big, that unless he fuels the dream, you have no chance of succeeding. Look at Moses. Moses could never have accomplished all that he accomplished without the intervening miraculous power of God in his life. He would never have led the people out of, out of Egypt if the power of God hadn't shown up in his life. Isn't that true? And even when he finally got them out of Egypt, they would never have made it across the Red Sea. They would never have escaped the army except for the supernatural power of God. See, the difference between God's plans and our plans is that we make small plans and God makes big plans. And our plans can be carried out in our strength, but God's plans can only be carried out in His. 
You know what? It's impossible to have more vision than God. It's impossible to have a bigger dream than God. It's impossible to, to have more courage than God. Do God's will, God's way. Let him give you a dream, his dream, his plan for your life. And you can rest assured that God's dreams are bigger than your dreams. And that with his help, they're always possible. God spoke through the prophet Jeremiah, one of our favorite verses in modern Christianity. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. And I know that that verse, that, that was a quote that was, the prophet was speaking directly to the people of Israel in their captivity. But, it's, but there's an application there for all of us because it's still the heart of God that he, he wants to use us. He wants to prosper us. And I'm not talking about just financial prosperity. I'm talking about he wants to prosper us in our ministry. He wants to prosper us in the gospel. He wants to see our families come to know Jesus. He wants to use us to bring hundreds of people into the kingdom of God. He wants to do that and he wants to give us hope and he wants to give us a future in him. My friend, God has big plans for you. I'm going to say it again. I want you to hear it. Put your name in there. God has big plans for you. And if you're trying to live your life according to your own goals and your own dreams and your own plans, I hate to tell you, if that's what you're doing, you're at risk of wasting your life away. Because if you live your life for your own plans, for your own dreams, for your own goals, when it's all said and done, you will have nothing. And you'll have, you will have wasted your life. The first le lesson we learn from the life of Moses is that you will be most fulfilled in life if you seek to do God's will in God's way. All the other things we chase, all the dreams, all the plans we think that will bring fulfillment, they leave us empty. But we'll be fulfilled in life when we seek to do God's will in God's way. The fact is, your life, your entire life, has been leading up to this moment. I encourage you, my friend, don't miss your moment. Watch this video. There are moments in your life when God intends to bring a blessing through you to someone else, but it has to come uniquely through you because there are some things only you can do. There are some needs only you can see, some hands only you can hold, some prayers only you can pray, some tears only you can cry, some gifts only you can give, some meals only you can cook. There are some people only you can reach, some moments only you can take. Think about it, God placed you in your specific family, in this generation, in this time in history, in your unique demographic situation, in this specific geographic location, so that you can make a difference there. What's your difficult step of obedience that's right in front of you? A great God made you to be great, so act like it. Don't miss your moment. Don't miss your moment. God has big plans for you. So be ready to hear the call of God. Would you bow your head and let's pray. Father, as we come into your presence, we, we believe, God, that this is truth. We believe that you have a plan for each of us. And, and Lord, you have great plans. Now, you define great in a different way than we do. So, God, we're not here to, to, to say that that you have plans to make each one of us great, famous evangelists that will be traveling the world. God, that's not what it is. But greatness in your kingdom has to do with faithfulness and obedience. And God, we know you have great plans 
that you want to carry out. There are lives you want to touch. There are people you want to change. There are things that you want to accomplish. And Lord God, you have placed us here because it's all part of your intricate plan to reach this world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And God, we don't want to miss our moment. This is our chance. This is our opportunity. And we don't want to miss this opportunity. We don't, we don't want to be the, the missing link that causes somebody to miss out with Christ. God, we want to seize the day. We want to seize this moment. We want to live our lives in a way that we, we understand that you have a plan for us, that you're going to use us. But Lord, that only happens when we humble ourselves in your presence and we let go of our pride and we say, Lord, you have your way. Let me do what you want and help me to do it in your way. And God, when that happens, we know that we'll never, ever accomplish these things in our own strength and power. And I pray, Lord, that in Jesus' name, that you would help us to look to you, to say, Lord, I, I, I sense this calling. I sense this tugging at my heart. And I realize, Jesus, that it's bigger than me. And I can't do this. So, Lord, I throw myself on your mercy and ask for your strength. Accomplish what only you can accomplish and do it through me, God. With heads bowed and eyes closed, and there's nobody looking around. I just want to know if there's anybody here who would say, Pastor Dave, I'm ready to seize this moment. I'm ready to seize the moment that God has given me. I'm ready to, to take to, on the, the calling of God. I realize that he has placed me in my family, in my neighborhood, in my geographical area, in my place of employment, that he's put me where I am for a strategic purpose. And I don't want to miss this moment because there are lives that he could touch through me if I'll just humble myself and throw myself on his mercy and let him move through me. And if that's you, you say, Pastor, I hear the calling of God. And I just want to say, here am I. Send me. Like Isaiah did when he saw God in his vision in Isaiah chapter 6. God said, ask the question that rings out throughout all, all of eternity to us. When God says, whom shall I send? Who will go for me? And Isaiah answered, here I am. Send me. And I'm asking you today, will you answer the same call? And by slipping your hand up, say, here I am, send me. Would you do that? Slip your hand up if that's your heart today in this place. God, you see, just about every hand is up. Lord, we want our lives to count. We want our lives to matter. So God, we want you to fulfill your plan. Because if I fulfill my plan for my life, my life will not matter. My life will be wasted. But if I pursue your calling and I do it in your way, with your strength, then my life will matter for eternity because people will come to know Jesus through me. So God, I pray that as every person has raised their hand and they've expressed that desire, Lord, I'm asking God that we would just simply come to the end of ourselves, that we realize that we truly are nothing, and God, that we would just put ourselves on your altar and say, here I am, God. Use me any way you want. And God, in the coming days, when you speak to us, when you whisper in our ear and you say, I want you to go talk to this person. I want you to go uh, to, to give this person a hug and let him know I love them. If I, I want you to send this card to somebody. I want you to cook a meal for this person. Whatever it is that you prompt us to do, God, I pray that we would, we would not resist, but we realize this is all about you. And God, that we would do your will in your way, in your strength. And I thank you for what you're going to accomplish in us and what you're going to accomplish through us. And we pray all of this in the strong name of Jesus. Amen.